uh, and her um, understanding of the numbers, I think, is what has helped the city move forward. Um, I don't want to be a numbers junkie here today, but I do think numbers matter, and uh, understanding the um, the uh, impact that her decisions have had uh, or will have on the city's finances is uh, what has brought, um, I think, Houston to the fore. Um, so it is uh, my pleasure. Screen, I, I have no idea. I don't. The, the screen should be live behind us. And maybe, um, maybe this. Kathleen, we can also do state the state first. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, do you want? Why, why don't we? Why don't we switch our our, our presentation then, and we'll move. Uh, we'll move actually to Wayne County, um, and um, Wayne County um, uh, is is here today not only because of the bold leadership they've taken in what is really a um, uh, a very challenging economic environment. Is uh, uh, Wayne County is part of Detroit, Michigan, or Detroit, Michigan is Carla uh, Sledge. Carla has a storied background. She came from a background as a CPA at Ernest and Young, and uh, and then uh, uh, served. Uh, uh, is serving as the chief financial officer uh, for uh, Wayne County. Uh, importantly, uh, Carla uh, has a broader understanding than just uh, uh, Wayne County. She was the uh, president of the uh, of the uh, GFOA, which is the Government Finance Officers Association, so she she has a national um, uh, perspective as well as hands-on in terms of uh, her local um, system. So, Carla, thank you. And and uh, you see the the joy of tech support has arrived. Yes. for those very kind words. Um, let me just start off by telling you about Wayne County because I need to just set the backdrop for you in case you're not very familiar with Wayne County. I came to Wayne County, Michigan in about 1995. And just to give you a little bit of background, we had a budget of about $2.3 billion. It was the 11th largest county in the world. Uh, we had a general fund balance on reserve of about $30 million, and I know that's not according to GFOA standards, but you have to remember that back in the 1980s, uh, Wayne County basically had to go through emergency management because it had a, a $134 million uh, deficit general fund. There were uh, three DB plans when I came to the county, one which would have been closed in 1983 to new hires. And then there was one plan for, uh, which we call a defined contribution plan. And, and just to give you a little bit perspective, more perspective on that, that uh, defined contribution plan was um, for all employees, but in particular, it was for those union employees that paid, you know, for every dollar that they paid, the county paid four. And for folks like me, for every dollar I paid, the county paid five. And so in September of about 2009, that plan was closed to union employees, but it was still left open for uh, executives such as myself. The plan one, uh, if I might give you a little perspective on that, depending on the particular bargaining unit, either had a 2.65% multiplier for each year or a 2% for each year up to 20 years and a 2.5% multiplier for each year over 20 years. And the maximum county finance portion was about 75% of annual final compensation. The minimum monthly pension is about $5 per month and then multiplied by the number of years of service. Plan 2 option was 1% or is 1% for each year up to 20 years and a 1.25% for each year over 20 years and the maximum county finance portion was 75% of average final compensation as well. Plan 3 option, depending on the applicable, again, collective bargaining unit, 
either had a 2% uh, for up to 20 years, a 2.5% for each year between 20 and 25 years, and a 3% for each year over 25 years, or it had a 1.5% for each year up to 20 years, 2% for each year between 20 and 25 years, and 2.5% for each year over 25 years. And again, the maximum county finance portion was 75% of average final compensation. We did that, obviously, to attract good talent. As you well know, a lot of folks chose sometimes government was the last option to come to, and whereas we couldn't pay great salaries, we were always willing to give great benefits. In 1995, we had about uh, 5,600 retirees and 7,000 actives, including the airport. At that time, the airport was a part of Wayne County. It is now a, an authority. The pensions were fully funded. And we had a rainy day fund of about $30 million. I'm going to fast forward now to 2009, and I'm, I'm going to 2009 because that's the last audited financial statements, where we have a budget now of about $2.1 billion. We are now the 13th largest county. We have lost population in the city of Detroit. I know that's not news to most of you. Our general fund balance has an unreserved negative $6.8 million. Our rainy day fund has dropped to $3 million. And we now have, again, we still have the, th the closed three uh, defined benefit plans, but we have added, and I think it was fiscal year 2001, a uh, plan five option, which is our hybrid plan. And again, it's dependent upon the uh, collective bargaining agreement, but there's a 2% or 2 per year for each year of credited service or 1.25% for each year up to 20 years for that hybrid plan. Um, the county has about 4,900 now employees, and uh, we actually have about 5,600 retirees. So the number of actives is uh, declining and will continue to decline. 90% uh, of the workforce is represented by collective bargaining units, and the average age of entry is about 30.8 years. Average age of retirement is about 55.1 years, and the average salar salary increase was 4%. And I say was, for the last two bargaining agreements, our uh, increases have been zeros. And then we anticipate none in the near future. As of the 2009 actuarial, the county is approximately 63% funded with its pensions. And so the retirement department, which again is a separate uh, uh, department from myself, although I get a chance to sit on that commission along with a representative from the commission, along with the rep or some representatives from uh, retirees, disperses about $99 million annually in pension benefits to about, again, 5,600 retirees and or its beneficiaries. And the interesting part about this is there's an additional disbursement, which we call the 13th check. And I'm sure some of you are very familiar with that 13th check. And it is made up to each participant as calculated by the plan's actuaries and approved by the plan's retirement board in, in accordance with the provisions of the pension ordinance. That disbursement for the prior year, the year 2008-2009, was about $9.4 million. There's no formula for it. They just uh, come up with a number and they divide it evenly among the retirees. Now, again, we, re we call it a 13th check due to the popular usage, but again, the 13th check is not the uh, regular amount of a retiree's monthly annuity. <clears throat> The fund has suffered some investment losses, as you can guess, in recent years, and the fund itself is unable to afford any kind of benefit increases for retirees. So in order to approve a 13th check for retirees, the pension board either had to contribute enough money to the fund to bring it back to its financial health and then include enough to allow the county to pay for the check or simply fund the payment directly from county coffers. And so given the anticipated deficit of $52 million for the county this year, uh, this 13th check, if you will, is being evaluated and uh, as it is not a benefit that is promised through union agreements. All right, so what have I done, what have we learned? <laughs> 
uh, should I say. Uh, we're all familiar with the fact that government accounting standards, GASB 25 and 27, uh, to talk about the escalating liabilities for unfunded pension plans and how they must now be carried on the balance sheets of state and local governments. And of course, this particular GASB or these GASBs uh, challenge our debt ratings. It challenged the, it raises the cost of borrowing. It's the um, and then if not made, of course, turn and create larger budget deficits. And on top of that, with our declining tax revenues. Uh, combined with a decade of substandard investment returns. All of these things just help uh, force for us to come up with other creative ideas on how we can help uh, meet this obligation and hopefully uh, not be in trouble with the angry employees, needless to say political backlash, and of course the voters. So what we've come up with is something that we call the unique solution. Well, it's, that's not my name. <laughs> it is, uh, we're using some consultants. And it's an effort to unfund, <laughs> to unfund our unfunded, or to fund our unfunded liability. You heard me say in my beginning remarks that we're about 63% funded. So here's the methodology. The county currently provides term life insurance for all of its employees as we speak today. And there is currently over 208 million of death benefits in place and available to employees through the existing group term plan. Uh, we're, we're, some of us are sitting here speechless. <laughs> <laughs> so under this unique solution, a TPA, or the consultant, was arranged for an insurance carrier to provide group term coverage to the county for active employees. The county modifies the insurance structure of its employee life insurance program, purchasing group whole life insurance as opposed to group term life insurance for all active employees. The death benefit available to the employee's named beneficiary still remains the same. So when the employee is no longer an active employee of the county, the death benefit coverage will vest to the pension plan. So the pension books the present value, of course, given an actuarial discounted method of the total death benefit of the employee life insurance program, less an agreed upon amount to account for the employee mortality while still employed by the county. So the resulting increase to the unique solution is reflected as an additional asset of the pension. <coughs> So this strategy limits... Is this kind of an arbitrage of death? <laughs> <laughs> the, the strategy limits premium payments to new revenues and permits future contract payments to not be a liability on the oh, county's yeah. balance sheet. And upon death of a non-active of a former employee, the death benefit is paid to the pension, providing additional revenues to offset underfunded pensions. Now I'm just going to, because that was a lot said, I'm going to show you the slide on what we're Who's kind of looking at. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you that name later. Okay. All right, so, so take a look yeah. at the slide up here. If you take a look at this slide, you'll notice that, uh, let's just assume for sake of this conversation that we're going to give everybody a death benefit of $280,000. And let's just look at the very first column, which tells you about our current year obligation. You'll see that our funding level, as I've said about two or three times now, is about 63%. And that, of course, there, as we sit today, there's no total permanent death benefit. Our current plan assets, of course, are under 850. And, of course, no solution being done today would stay at about 850. Our current liability is about $1.3 billion. And, of course, our unfunded, overfunded ALL is uh, at uh, a negative $488 million. Um, our our uh, ARC estimated, of course, for 2010 is about $58 million. And then our group term life premium, as we sit today, is about 202000 and some change. So our total cost, bottom line, is about $58 million and some change. Using the unique solution, and it's under various uh, discounts, as you can see, under the 6% discount, 7% discount, the 8% discount, uh, we would create an asset assuming we're going with the $280,000 of about uh, a, um, we would have a funding level that is of 109%. And our total permanent death benefit, as you can see in the first column of the 6%, is about $1.1 billion. Now I'm not going to read through this entire slide for you, but if you just look down at the bottom line, you'll see that uh, 
the group home or the group whole life premium obviously is uh, is something that we would be uh, have to be out of pocket for as opposed to the group term and uh, it, it's, it remains the same no matter which discount we use but the TPA who says that uh, they're charging 35 per head is only charging us a flat fee of about one hundred and forty two thousand dollars and some change so our total cost respectively for the six percent seven percent and eight percent is about thirty nine million thirty four million and twenty nine million and then of course our first year savings are, are about eighteen million and twenty three million and about twenty eight million so this solution of course uh, as you ponder on that slide <laughs> this solution has for uh, has quite a few benefits obviously it helps us to create a positive benefit for the employees that is whole life versus term it addresses the shortfall of the pension and and they say OPEB we're looking to do it with the pension uh, being underfunded it provides additional funding necessary for the county to meet its commitments and it provides benefits to the county after the pension terms are met. This has to be negotiated, of course, with the bargaining units. And uh, in my, our minds, it's just another alternative to, so to solve the unfunded liability, which are kind of less appealing, such as increasing ta taxes and arbitrage, which I heard someone say before, borrowing money at a rate and investing those funds at a higher rate. Um, and then it also helps us with the issue of not being able to honor the liabilities that are guaranteed and then it also helps us to negotiate with lower benefits so that's kind of our new creative out of the box <laughs> thinking for our unfunded uh, liabilities and i'll be happy to answer questions for you later thank you very much <laughs> Now we're going to rotate back to the city of Houston, if we may, and um, we'll get the city of Houston slides up. And Anne, do you want to begin your your comments? I'd be happy to. Um. That is uh, my colleague, Craig Mason's presentation. And so we will leave the uh, city seal and the slide up there um, because when talking about politics and political realities and the vagaries of uh, negotiation, one does not need a PowerPoint. So uh, that is, my, that is my, my role here today. My name is Ann Clutterbuck. I'm the mayor pro tem of the city of Houston. I'm an elected official. I am also a city council member and I represent about 300,000 people on city council. We, um, I'm also chair of the Budget and Fiscal Affairs Committee. I am in the last term of my um, three two-year terms, so I'm in my fifth year. And um, I serve on a council body where each council member has one vote. There are 14 council members, and our vote is also uh, equal to that of the mayor, who also has one vote. The mayor is also term limited. We also, in our system of governance, have a, an elected city controller who does not have a vote on council but must certify the availability of funds on anything that we end up voting on. As, uh, term, also term I, I beg your pardon, I'm sorry. Uh, is, the question is, is the controller also term limited? Yes, everybody's, everybody's term limited. Um, we have the most restrictive term limits um, it, by our estimation, certainly in the state of Texas, now that uh, San Antonio increased their length of term and, um, and it has impacts, which I will um, address in just a moment. Uh, Kathleen asked nicely if I could, if I could uh, just tell you a little bit about our new mayor. She is uh, not new to anybody in the city of Houston. She is the first mayor who both served uh, as a council member for six years and then as our city controller for six years. So she comes to being mayor with a, a broad perspective. Um, she comes after um, one of our most outstanding mayors, in my opinion, Mayor Bill White, who uh, it just did a, did a tremendous job bringing private sector and investment experience and management experience to really truly turning things around at the city of Houston. And he inherited a number of challenges, not the least of which was a challenge with regard to our pension. <clears throat> um, and and I, I would just like to, uh, in framing some of this also, uh, add our sincere thanks and appreciation for being recognized. We. Um, we are tremendously honored that we would be recognized by this organization. And 
it is my pleasure to absolute, actually to learn uh, what other people are doing in other, in other municipalities and states, what the trends are, and I'm personally thrilled that we are actually having this discussion in what I, what I believe is a very challenging um, tsunami on the horizon. And I think that that leads to what is probably our most significant challenge in the political arena is convincing people that there is a problem. Uh, it, it is staggering to me as I have attempted um, to talk with my le friends in the state legislature about the need for some kind of change. Their, their complete lack of awareness of it, um, their, uh, and that's just in, in the legislature. Um, it, and I would also add that our challenge comes in convincing the public that there is a problem. Uh, the taxpayers, um, of course, understand probably that there is a problem, and certainly the new new taxpayers coming on the scene are unwilling to fund with taxpayer dollars what they believe is an excessively generous program when they themselves have not funded their own programs. And certainly, as we've noticed um, in the excellent discussion earlier, the unions and other employee um, uh, representatives are challenging any reforms that are made generally across the across the country, <clears throat> and um, and certainly we have our challenges in Houston. Uh, we have, uh, and I'll, uh, Craig Mason, my colleague, who is our pension executive, will highlight the specifics of what the city of Houston did. But I would like to say that we. Uh, we also face our own political challenges. For example, last uh, well, two weeks ago, I brought in photographs of some city employees sleeping on the job. And it was uh, in an effort as we are framing our budget discussions going forward how, how we could find efficiencies and, and certainly improve safety <laughs> standards, <laughs> things like that. Believe it or not, I then learned from another colleague uh, how to justify sleeping on the job. And I will explain that to you afterwards. If anybody's interested, uh, it's an Alice in Wonderland down the rabbit hole experience. It's fascinating. But I mention it just to, to highlight the challenges that we have. And they end up coming in, in any time you try to change a benefit plan, whether it's for new hires or for existing employees or for, for health care benefits. In, um, in the negotiating, they sit and look at our massive budget and they say, well, you're fixing a, a, a great road that really didn't need fixing. Yeah. And you made a contractual obligation to me. Or you, you may not have made that obligation, but it was, it was implied. And those are the kinds of give and takes and challenges that we have. Um, in addition to the fact that we then also have term limits as well as uh, and I'm going to use this phrase, ignorant public officials. And I count myself in that category. I don't mean that as a pejorative term. I mean that in that we have people who come to elective office who are not educated in matters of municipal finance and are not educated in matters of, of pensions. And so you're having to bring them up to speed on this. And when they also have the political pressures of justifying sleeping on the job or, or um, seeing, seeing projects that appear to them to be wasteful, it gets to be very, very difficult. Um, in the city of Houston, we were able to accomplish a number of changes, which Craig will go into, that I think were the result of a number of things that I throw out and suggest to other municipalities. First of all, we had a strong mayor, Bill White, who wanted to see this accomplished. Um, I, I joke that I think that probably had he known the crisis that was ahead of him, he never would have run for office. One of the things that he realized after he took office was that a change adopted by the previous mayor and council that was going to raise um, the city contribution from 10% of payroll up to about 15% actually had the effect of increasing it over 50 percent. Whoops! Uh, huge problem. So that, and, and possibly possibly some criminal neglect there uh, by, by previous people, but um, <laughs> so that, that combined with, um, <clears throat> with uh, our negotiations on the pension coincided with our meet and confer negotiations, which was also very favorable, 
we worked on uh, at the meet and confer, we worked on implementing the first time ever for our municipal employees, or the first time in many years, um, an actually cost an actual cost of living increase of three percent plus a 1.25 in uh, performance bonus, which by the way we will be fully funding um, next year as well. Um, and I'd like to brag the city of Houston has not had any layoffs or furloughs, um, so it's uh, it, it, still a challenge. Um, so combined with the meet and confer, and then um, uh, on the heels of that bad calculation, also we had a new union in town. This was at the time on the heels of, of uh, SEIU coming into town. Uh, the, you remember the SEIU AFL CIO split, mm -hmm. and then our old union, AFSME, uh, was completely caught off guard by, by the new wave of SEIU, and we formed uh, our own union in the city of Houston called Houston Hope. So we had new leadership there, that with a strong, uh, strong mayor and. Um, and then having the agreement of the union with these changes, we were able to implement a um, kind of a, a, a hybrid plan of sorts. Um, and unless you have the agreement of the union, um, you have to rely on passing statutes that are subject to legal challenge or um, threatening bankruptcy or threatening to go to the voters uh, for a referendum. And we have certainly learned in the city of Houston it's much easier to work a deal at the front end rather than trying to salvage it at the back end. Um, it, again, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions about our perspective. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to get into a little bit more specific now about uh, what we did with the uh, pension plans. I'm going to focus on one plan, which I'll talk about later, but I wanted to give you a little bit more of, a, of the context in which we are operating at the city. The city sponsors three separate plans, one for the civilians, one for the firefighters, and one for the police. Uh, the administration of those plans is, is basically outsourced to uh, three separate independent uh, trust organizations which are established and governed by state statutes to do two things basically. Uh, manage the investments and pay the benefits when they're due. Uh, one of the big problems I, I, I see is uh, that in those state statutes, the plan provisions, that is the plan design, how much to pay and when, is embedded in the same state statutes that uh, establishes the trust administrative organizations. And I think uh, real reform down the road probably can't happen in my lifetime. But what you have there is uh, <clears throat> state legislators responsible for what the city of Houston pays its employees with regard to one, just one element of the total compensation package, state legislatures from Amarillo, da Dallas, of course Dallas doesn't even like Houston, so <laughs> <laughs> cut and shoot, wherever they come from, they, they have no interest in what uh, the city, and no knowledge of what the city is paying their its employees and other elements, nor do they have any responsibility for funding them. So I think there's a, there's, a, there's a flaw in the structure there. What I would like to see eventually is that the, the plan design elements would be under local control. Uh, the state's responsibility could be on benefit security, not, not benefit design. Um, two of the plans, the municipal plan and the police, have uh, meet and confer capabilities, meaning that if the pension boards, the independent organizations, when I say independent, I mean independent from the city. If the, if the city and the pension boards can agree, changes can be made to the plan. The firefighter's plan does not have that capability, so any change uh, with regard to firefighters has to go to the state legislature, which meets uh, only every two years. So that's another little bit of a problem. Um, and by the way, <coughs> that structure also in my opinion, empowers the trust organizations a little bit too much with regard to plan design. I mean, their charter is to pay benefits when they're doing and invest money. 
um, giving them some, you're, you're almost giving them a, a third party administrator. It's like giving the uh, a bricklayer veto power over the architect or owner of the building. Uh, I think that's another structural problem. That's just me talking right now. But that's the environment we have to operate in. Uh, Ann mentioned the unions. The unions actually, there's three separate unions. They actually don't bargain for the pensions. The pension boards do, except for the uh, firefighters. Uh, and that's kind of unusual, I think, too. Uh, you have, you know, you've separated one element of compensation out of this overall bargaining process for, in, in my total compensation. Um, here. Uh, just to give you an idea of the governance, uh, they're all a little bit different. You can see the numbers of trustees on these independent organizations. I think the key thing here is, uh, in, in all cases, in all three cases, a majority of the trustees are uh, beneficiaries, also beneficiaries of the plan, plans, which uh, I think creates some sort of inherent conflict of interest when they also have some power with regard to plan design. Uh, you can see here just the general size in terms of numbers of participants and, and assets. The B there stands for billion. Now here's the biggie. You can see that th th these, line, these uh, lines represent the uh, contribution the city's contribution to the plans over these, this period of time. Uh, you can see that in the, in the decade of the 90s, they were pretty stable. And then uh, benefit decisions were made in the 2000-2002 time period, uh, which spiked up the city contributions to unsustainable levels. Uh, we're going to focus today on the red line, which is the municipal plan, which was the most uh, egregious, where Ann mentioned the uh, pension board came to the city in 2001 and said, we'd like to have some benefit increases. And if, if you approve them, city council, uh, your contribution is going to increase from that 10% level that you can see was in effect for 10 so years before. It's going to increase to about 15%. Actually, the number was 14.7%. City council said, uh, apparently said, I wasn't there, but apparently neither was Ann. <laughs> apparently said, uh, okay, that sounds okay to us, we'll approve it. So then it has to go to the state legislature. Remember, the, these benefits are in the, in the legislative uh, statute, state statute. Uh, <clears throat> the state says, well, if the city says it's okay, it's okay with us. So the benefit uh, changes were approved. The latter part of uh, 2004, no, um, 2003, uh, the actuary for the pension board uh, makes a report and says, uh, well, uh, city, your, your contribution really needs to be 52.9% payroll. <laughs> so that's a challenge. <laughs> There's another problem with the structure there. Here again, the, the, the actuary, by the way, I'm an actuary by background. <laughs> the, uh, the pension board uh, blamed it on an actuarial mistake. <laughs> But the problem is the pension board works for the, I mean, the actuary works for the pension board, not the plan sponsor. Mm -hmm. uh, the communications between the actuary uh, were with the pension board only. The communications to the city was from the pension board to the, uh, to the city. So while the pension board says it was an actuarial error, I'm not sure. I mean, they could have been answering a question See so you nodding your head. <laughs> they could have been answering the question correctly. It just didn't get communicated yeah. properly to the city. So that happened in the fall of 2003. Mayor Bill White, whom Ann referred to, uh, <laughs> assumed office in January 2004 and uh, basically inherited this problem. As she said, had he known this, he probably would have uh, refused to, to be elected. Well, he did a number of things, which I think were, were, uh, were interesting. First thing he did, I mean, it, it, this was in, in May of 2004, he orchestrated a uh, general election where the uh, state constitution had an amendment that would have uh, uh, 
not permitted localities from reducing accrued pension benefits unless that locality had a general election and the citizens voted to exempt themselves from that provision. So he orchestrated this general election in May of 2004, went to the citizens of Houston, and they uh, opted out of the state constitution, constitutional provision to uh, prohibit uh, reducing accrued benefits. So that option is there. It hasn't been used yet, as we'll see, but it, it is apparently there. Legally, we think, anyway. <laughs> uh, he formed a task force of business leaders to help him address the issues. Uh, they came up with a number of ideas. Uh, they changed the governance a little bit on the municipal plan to appoint more, uh, to have more appointed uh, trustees versus uh, non-beneficiary appointed trustees versus selected beneficiaries. Still a minority. Uh, he created the position of chief pension executive, which, which I eventually uh, filled in uh, the fall of 2005. And uh, they were able to execute meet and confer agreements with both the police plan and the uh, municipal plan to uh, address the, the, the uh, situation on an interim basis. This is before I got there. And this is nothing new. This is not why we won anything. But what, what they did was pretty simple. They reduced their future benefit accrual rates. This, this was an agreement. Now, remember, they had to meet and confer capabilities. They didn't have to go to the state legislature. Uh, they increased the eligibility age for retirement from the rule of 70 to the rule of 75. Age plus service equals those numbers. That, by the way, when I first got there, that was the biggest complaint of the, of the employees of the city uh, that I heard. Uh, they, wondered, they wondered if uh, you know, the, the mayor was going to reduce that age, I mean uh, increase that age further. Uh, they increased the mandatory employee contribution rate from 4% to 5%. Uh, transferred, this is an interesting one, they transferred an asset valued at $300 million to the pension fund. Uh, briefly, that was a note from the city to the pension fund for $300 million secured by a city-owned hotel. So they, they beefed up the assets in the pension plan by $300 million. So was um, controversial, too. That was controversial. Politically controversial. Politically controversial. I think the, the theory was they would eventually sell the hotel and pay off that note, mm -hmm. and, the money would be, and then the money would be in the, in the fund. Uh, the, the hotel sales market, uh, the market for hotels is not good, so we still, the city still owns the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> but they did, uh, they did uh, convert that note to a, actually, a, I guess, a pension obligation bond. That, that note carried 8.5% uh, interest on it, but the, so they refinanced that with a pension obligation bond, where uh, the interest rate is only 6.2%, I think. Uh, and uh, the other part of the uh, agreement is they established a uh, increasing dollar city contributions for a period of time. Well, that resulted, uh, those interim steps resulted in a reduction at least from 52% of payroll to 24% of payroll contribution, still substantially above what the city council thought they were approving, which was 15% uh, of payroll. Uh, I came on board in 2005, and uh, basically <laughs> my position was uh, described as uh, not really being a fixer, but a, an internal consultant, making sure that all stakeholders were aware of the issues, uh, city council, taxpayers, pension boards, state legislature, so that better decisions could be made in the future, and hopefully to prevent decisions that were made back in the 2001 time period. Um, I came from the private sector. I retired from uh, Mercer. Many of you know Mercer probably. Uh, I, and uh, so I came and I said, I looked at the plan and was focusing now only on the municipal plan. I said, this plan uh, is 
doesn't look like it's it looks like it's just kind of morphed into what it was. Yeah, I, I think I think the city ought to establish a set of objectives for a plan, and let's design a, a plan that meets those objectives. Now the plan, I guess, did have objectives, but it was probably uh, the pension board's objectives of getting the most we can without regard to whether the city is able or willing to pay for it. Uh, I envisioned myself facilitating a, a task force of city people uh, from the finance department, human resources, city council, uh, to develop this, formulate this statement of objectives, uh, then we could design a plan. I quickly learned Houston is a strong mayoral form of government. <laughs> the, the, these objectives came from the mayor. So we, we talked, and, and this is kind of an outline of, of the objectives that uh, he came up with. This is Mayor White. Should be an inter integral element of total compensation. Um, the, ba the basic level of income replacement uh, should be at no cost to the employee. It should promote uh, career employment and consider Social Security benefits. The, the, the current plan obviously didn't consider Social Security, the, consider the fact that municipal employees in Houston are covered by Social Security. The, the municipal plan before this could provide 90% of pay as a replacement ratio, not including Social Security. So they obviously didn't consider the fact that these people were covered by Social Security. They also uh, they had competing objectives in there. They had generous, what I what I would call fairly generous benefits payable at an early age, which would imply uh, an objective of encouraging people to leave early. And then they added a drop provision, which uh, is a method uh, or has an objective of encouraging people to stay on. So you had a plan that had competing objectives. <laughs> or you, you want them to stay or do you want them to leave? <coughs> and uh, that generally creates uh, liability that, that we don't want. Uh, so one of the other objectives was the ability to, uh, or, or enhance the ability to hire mid-career employees. Uh, because of the, uh, the way the plan was structured with a mandatory 5% uh, employee contribution rate, Actually, I would say it's not a contribution, it was a tax. 5% tax the employees had to, because they didn't really affect their, benef their individual benefit. They didn't get any interest on it when it was returned if they were not vested, so it was, it's more like a tax. Uh, one thing the mayor really liked was providing employees uh, opportunity and flexibility to do something to manage their own money. So he wanted to provide them with uh, what, what I call a capital accumulation opportunity uh, and flexibility, and to in, that by nature increases the risk uh, responsibility to the employee versus all risk being assumed by the city, which was the way the current plan is or was. And uh, bottom line is, he wanted to try to get the future city contribution level at around 15% of payroll. So with those objectives in mind, this is what we came up with. And I call it a hybrid approach. <coughs> it's not a hybrid plan in that a hybrid plan to me uh, has features, has both defined contribution and defined benefit features in the same plan. So I call this a hybrid approach where you've got a, a, a defined benefit plan by itself and a, and a defined contribution plan, companion defined contribution plan. My original concept was to actually have a hybrid plan, but when we went through the, when the, the, the negotiation process went through with the pension board and so forth, uh, they already had a an existing defined contribution plan, a 457 plan, kind of like the you know 401k plan for public entities. And they said, why don't we just use that instead of putting the defined contribution inside? Okay, so. Two approaches, basic level of income replacement, income replacement and capital accumulation opportunity. Income replacement is a defined benefit kind of plan. Capital accumulation is defined contribution. So we have a combination. The capital accumulation is voluntary. 
uh, the income replacement <coughs> target benefits at full benefits at age 62. So you, you still could retire at the rule of 75, but if you retire before 62, you get benefit reductions. So that was to encourage people to, to stay on. And, and these are the levels uh, that the formula works out to be. You get 45% of pay from the defined benefit, plus Social Security, plus whatever the employee does. That's the old three-legged stool after 25 years. And then, and then you can see 50% uh, plus Social Security, plus employee after 30. Uh, options to retire early. No, no cost of living. No automatic cost of living. That's up to the, it's going to be shifting more of that risk to the employees through the capital accumulation plan. No drop. And uh, basically, the new plan, had we started that from scratch, would uh, have uh, resulted in a, a contribution level of about 6% of pay. But since we're still, since the city's still paying for sins of the past, you, you're not going to get there for a while. Uh, so, uh, individual capital accumulation account provides <coughs> supplemental benefits on a voluntary basis. There's a great deal of uh, risk now that the city has reduced on itself and transferred some to the employees, the risk of, of uh, investment inflation and longevity. There's more of a, a sharing of risk between the uh, employee and the, between the city and its employees. So that's basically the new plan. Uh, it, it was, it is. Yeah. It is provided to new hires only after January 1 of 2008. There was discussion about uh, providing or providing it for all all existing actives or maybe just the non-vested. Came out to be all new hires, which was an easy thing to do. But again, it 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 just takes it's going to take longer for that six percent contribution level to phase in. Thank so you. I think, I think I did it in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and our final speaker uh, is Oregon, and uh, um, I certainly hope all of you can stay and listen to him because he has a lot of value to add here. I'll start leaving. Craig, is it annuities or single-sum distributions? For the defined method? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, annuities. What, what they can do is they, they, they can transfer their 457 account over to the DB plan and buy an annuity if they want to. Or they can take it in a lump sum. It's up to them. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, after listening uh, this morning, I've kind of revamped my introductory uh, remarks here. Um, uh, I don't know whether to start with hi, I'm Paul. I devastate state, local, and school district budgets for a living. <laughs> or, hi, I'm Paul. The rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated. And if I was in Michigan, maybe insured. <laughs> but I think you'll find that probably like the new normal, uh, the truth lies somewhere in between. Um, I'm going to describe our uh, road to reform here. Uh, and we've been on a, a, a long road uh, at Oregon. Uh, we started off in 1946 as a money match system, basically a kind of a defined contribution system, but the match came at retirement from employer reserves. So member contributions went in, investments, they earned, and then matched at retirement. Of course, uh, early on, those weren't generating sufficient benefits, uh, particularly since we weren't invested in equities uh, uh, back at that time. So people started tinkering with the system, and we added a formula plus annuity benefit, and then that didn't provide enough, so we added a full formula benefit. Uh, in 1975, we added a feature that really came back to bite us. Uh, <clears throat> we started investing pretty heavily in, in uh, uh, equities in, in 1970, and then, of course, we got hit with the 73 and 74 market downturn. Members went to the legislature, said, get the pension fund out of equities. So the state treasurer had the idea that, well, let's guarantee the return, the annual return, at the long-term assumed earnings rate. At that time, it was 4.5%, so we started down that path. Well, over the next 15 years, the assumed earnings rate ratcheted up to 8%, and that guarantee stayed in place. So in the 80s and 90s, we're crediting an average of 15 to 18 percent in the member accounts, and when we hit the down years, which for us is any year you learn less than 8 percent, we guaranteed at 8. Uh, and you can imagine uh, what the result was. Uh, 
we also, uh, during that time period, were kind of focused on the one-third of the iceberg that was sticking out of the water. We still thought of ourselves as a full formula system, and we were funding it at that rate, uh, which would put us at 50% of, of final salary with 30 years. It's a 1.67 factor. Unfortunately, uh, because of the uh, combination of high earnings and the guarantee, our member account balances uh, soared in the mid-90s, uh, uh, and money match became the predominant retirement benefit uh, overnight. <coughs> uh, all the while, the employers weren't seeing much relief from uh, the good earnings because liabilities were growing just as fast as, uh, as the earning returns were coming in. And they sued us in 1999 over what they uh, uh, alleged was an overcrediting to these member accounts. They got really nervous that we weren't setting aside enough money in, in a gain-loss reserve. And, uh, and so we had credited 20% to the members. That later was reduced to 11.33, only that was five years later mm -hmm. when that occurred. Uh, we hit a market downturn in the early 2000s. The employers saw their rates starting to soar again. And at the same time, members started retiring at 100% of final average wow. salary in a system that was designed and being funded to retire you at 50%. Obviously, uh, we were on a uh, on an <laughs> unsustainable path. Uh, our liabilities are growing at 12 percent. 17 billion dollar unfunded liability emerges. Uh, we go, we dropped to 65 percent funded, and our employer rates that had averaged around 12 percent uh, were projected to go uh, into the mid 30s. Um, we actually had started slowing the digging with a, with a reform in 1996. We added a, a second tier, tier two, uh, and those members don't get the earnings guarantee, uh, and we raise the retirement age to, uh, to 60. But in 2003, we stopped it entirely. We froze the money match benefits. Uh, we diverted the member contributions out of the accounts, so 6% of payroll no longer went into those accounts, and we capped the earnings at 8%. And any time we earn more than 8%, we put into a, a reserve uh, that then is used to uh, make up the 8% in the down years. Now, we started doing this uh, uh, with the uh, uh, 2000 uh, earnings, so we've, we've only credited 8% for 10 years, and we still have a hole in that reserve of about $441 uh, million, uh, about 5% of those accounts. So mm -hmm. it would take about a... a an additional 5% earnings above our 8% assumption to make up that hole. And probably a real key thing <coughs> was we reconstituted the PERS board. We went from a 12-member board with a majority uh, representing uh, uh, member interest to a five-member board. Three of them can't be affiliated at all uh, with the system uh, because there's some tough decisions that the board had to make. Uh, <coughs> that reform system was then able to take care of good earnings uh, in between 2003 and 2007. Uh, we dealt with the 1999 earnings overcrediting by adjusting 100,000 active member accounts and going back in and changing benefits for 44,000 retirees uh, we, and, and beneficiaries. Now, we haven't got to the widows and orphans yet because the court stopped us at that stage, and, uh, and I'm kind of hoping maybe I'll be gone by the time we get to that <laughs> part. But, uh, but we did go in and, uh, and adjust benefits and reduce the liabilities by what, about $1.6 billion. Those 2003 reforms in total reduced our liabilities by between 5 and $6 billion on current and retired members, and then cut our costs going forward uh, by some $8 billion as well. Um, so the liability growth rates decline. It's stabilized about 3% a year, and our replacement ratios are fast trending down. And here's two graphs that kind of show those trends. The first one is our, is our retirement calculation methods, and you can see that top line, the blue line, is, is the money be match benefits. All of a sudden, that became the move from about 30% of our retirements being calculated as money match to, uh, uh, to over 90%. That's trending down, and the same with the replacement ratio, uh, which is below uh, where we got our 30-year members are on the blue line, and the uh, yellow line is our total members, uh, and both of those are trending back downwards towards that 50% uh, 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 of pay. 
We've also, of course, implemented a new tier for new for new hires, and uh, and this is just a plain vanilla uh, defined benefit plan. That was an important uh, uh, feature that uh, Governor Kulingowski, uh, who was the leader of these reforms, uh, and uh, uh, it became a big issue in the 2002 governor's race, wanted to preserve. He wanted to preserve uh, a defined benefit element, and there was a big struggle. We had a. a a Republican uh, House and the Senate was split between Democrats and Republicans. So there was a big struggle between switching all new members into a DC plan, and and we came up with uh, uh, with being able to preserve kind of a plain vanilla DB plan with a uh, uh, a DC component, a hybrid component. But retirement age increased to 65. The formula benefit only gets you 45 percent at 30 years. Mm. We, we did a lot of things on final average salary to present, prevent some of the uh, uh, dysfunctions that can occur there. Uh, our COLA is uh, the uh, actual cost of living capped at 2 percent for the Tier 1 and Tier 2 retirees. They get to carry over uh, when we have higher uh, uh, cost of living increases than 2 percent. They get to carry over the excess that got eliminated here. Uh, there's no subsidy for retiree health insurance. Uh, Premiums. We in our tier one and tier two plans as a system, we provide very little. Uh, we give you sixty dollars a month at Medicare age, and we let you stay pooled with the actives pre-Medicare. Now, obviously, there's an implicit uh, subsidy associated with being pooled with the actives. I always tell people, if you know how to spell Lipitor, you want to be pooled with people who don't. <laughs> it's certainly an advantage there, and we recognize that, but uh, that's one of the things that, that have, has helped us out. We've not gotten into any major liabilities, uh, and we actually fund our, our $60 premium. Uh, member contributions now go into this individual account, uh, no uh, earnings guarantee, and no match. <coughs> Didn't come easy. Uh, don't want to don't want to imply that this stuff is easy. Uh, Pre-reform, of course, we as an agency, uh, we had pretty much lost our credibility. Uh, we'd failed to identify the problems. Uh, we failed to craft responsible solutions, and we were pretty much left out uh, of the solution that was crafted in 2003. And as a result, of course, the legislature, in their wisdom, developed a new program. <coughs> we'd have probably suggested a few changes. One of them would have been, don't require us to implement two new programs and an entirely new employer reporting system in four months. Uh, and also have all these retirement trigger dates that are going on at the same time to where our, we went from about 6,000 retirements annually to, to over 12,000, almost 13,000 that year. Uh, so we, we fixed the system, but we darn near broke the agency. And you need to keep that in mind as, uh, if you're reforming uh, anything. And then, of course, when you go in and modify current member benefits or recover money from retirees, you're going to get to know a number of attorneys on a first-name basis. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we had numerous lawsuits. Most of them we uh, prevailed on. Uh, we still have an active suit over whether we can collect money from retirees <coughs> and beneficiaries that already got out the door. It's pretty settled that we could reduce benefits going forward, but the question of whether we could collect, and it's about $160 million a question there, uh, is still active. <coughs> uh, and there were political ramifications as well. Uh, Governor Kulingowski, uh, uh, in his uh, uh, run for his second term, uh, didn't get endorsed uh, by the unions. They actually brought up another candidate in a primary and endorsed uh, him. Uh, the governor prevailed in that. Uh, we had several major Democrat uh, sponsors uh, that uh, uh, realized they weren't going to uh, be able to continue in the legislature. One of them went into administrative position. Another one tried to run for attorney general, didn't get the support of the unions. They brought up another candidate for that. So uh, it's tough things, uh, uh, you know, to make a, a system that uh, was basically unsustainable into one that you could sustain long term. Um, <coughs> Some principles uh, I think that I can share with you. Um, you know, focus on long-term sustainability, uh, adequate and affordable benefits. They got to be both. If they're not affordable, you're not going to be able to sustain them. If they're not adequate, you're not going to be able to sustain uh, the, the attractiveness of your uh, uh, of your system. Uh, 
do what you can to provide predictable and stable employer rates, always fund the ARC. Yeah. Really important. Don't, don't dig a hole by deferring the actually required contribution. Uh, protect your funded status by cr critically evaluating your assumptions. Uh, we go through that all the time. Uh, you know, the big question now is, you know, is your assumed earnings rate? Uh, reasonable or not. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, in the 90s uh, we had members showing up when we were averaging 18 percent returns screaming why don't you raise your assumed earnings rate because that was their guarantee and they'd say any idiot can earn 8 <coughs> percent. <laughs> we're having trouble with our idiots earning 8 percent right now but we didn't change it then and, uh, and, and we're evaluating it today. We're going through an asset liability study, but, but we try to focus on, on the long term. Uh, and we also are people who believe that, uh, you know, everything eventually is going to revert to the mean. So we're hoping to see that reversion in this next 10-year period. <coughs> uh, maintain intergenerational equity. Uh, be an accurate, credible information source. And make decisions in an open and transparent manner. We still got a long road to go. We are an investment-based retirement system. 69% of our revenues come from investment returns, uh, and that is the key for our sustainability. Um, we're also a mature system. Uh, about 65% of our liabilities are baked in for retirees and inactives. My employer rate <coughs> uh, for, uh, uh, for the upcoming biennium uh, forty percent of that, and it's going to average about sixteen percent of payroll. Forty percent of that isn't going for the benefits on the salaries that I'm assessing it, it, it against. It's going to pay off the unfunded liability for retirees that reemerged. Mm -hmm. You know, we were 112 percent funded at the end of 2007. 2008 knocked us down to about 80 percent funded. We've come back to about 87 percent funded with the 2009 returns. <clears throat> but that's a difficult thing for people to understand. I'm, I'm collecting money on people's salary to pay benefits to the person they replaced. And so you can't just say, well, you guys, you're, you're, you're assessing, you know, 16% against pay for this person's benefits. Actually, only about 12 for their benefit, and the rest of it's going for uh, the person they replaced. Um, you know, we we recognize that full recovery from those 2008 returns is going to have to occur for, in order for us to stabilize uh, this system. If you don't believe that we're going to have <clears> 1% <throat> decrease on a payable, the whole ball game is on the investment returns, uh, and it's critical for us to see a recovery from that. Um, that's kind of, uh, kind of where we stand. I would like to point out, you know, all retirement systems collect money and pay benefits. But beyond that, any similarity is merely coincidental. <laughs> uh, I think you're going to recognize, you know, we had some pretty unique situations. We addressed those situations. Hopefully some of the guiding principles can apply regardless of the specifics of your plan. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we take about 10 minutes of questions from the audience. Um, as I said, I thought this would be um, an inspirational panel, and I think it's proven to be so. Um, I echo uh, the comments uh, just made by, uh, by Paul. Uh, there are so many uh, uh, thousands of uh, variations of plans out there that you need to find your own path um, to solvency, and importantly, you need to constantly review it be right on the assumptions and uh, being willing to uh, to accept the changes that are necessary. Are we ha do we have any questions from audience members out there? Yes, if you could identify yourself. Uh, I'm Sandy McKenzie from AARP. Um, I had a question for Carla. Just a very briefly, um, I, I don't understand the assumption that you're making about how you can go from being so underfunded to being slightly overfunded how you can go from being so underfunded to being slightly overfunded because of an insurance transaction. Well, and, and that's the whole, uh, uh, I guess, benefit of this unique solution. If, if you're able, and of course, let me, I should back up, which I didn't say in remarks. In Michigan, uh, it is, uh, we are able to uh, take care of insurance. We can get insurance, insurance interest from our, our folks. So that's the first thing. It is a law issue. In, in Michigan, we've researched that. 
But if you're buying uh, group insurance or termits we have now, obviously there's no benefit uh, for us in the county. And I think, if I remember correctly, for retirees, the benefit is only about $5,000 once you've retired. While you're inactive, I think it's about one or one and a half times your salary, depending on what uh, level you are. So if you get this in, insurable interest, which again has to be bargained for, and uh, you get one of the three or maybe two of the three, whichever you want to do, uh, insurance companies, which of course you know that won't go out of business uh, in, the, in the next year. They're pretty reputable insurance companies to go ahead and buy this group, whole, I mean this whole life insurance for you, then immediately you, uh, you have created this asset on the books. But there's a, must be a corresponding liability. Well, yeah, and I and, and the liability absolutely. There is still the liability on there. I mean, you obviously your your cost. Well, let me back up. The costs go up for buying whole life insurance first because my group term life insurance was much less, and that was on the slide. I mean, my group term is only about two hundred two thousand, and when you buy the the premium for the whole life goes up. I don't remember the exact the numbers now, but it goes up. But at the end of the day, uh, I have a net savings. Uh, by creating this asset. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth. Just a follow up to that because I was kind of scratching my head trying to figure it out too. So uh, you, you buy a policy for an individual worker and that policy would be worth what? what whatever. I mean, I, I just used up, okay. I used the number 200 and what, what it was, 80,000 on that slide. And then a portion of that group, a whole life cash benefit then goes to the county? Is that how it works? I mean, how does the county get a financial gain from but, its insurance policy? You're exactly right. It goes to the county. The cash value? Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yes. You talked about... Could you identify yourself, please? Um, my name is Olin Sinoa. Um, I just want to focus on the national rate of Right. Right. Um, are you still using the 8% and do you think that's sustainable long Right. Uh, yeah, we, we review our uh, return assumption every two years. Uh, we reviewed it last spring and we use our actuary and their capital market projections as well as our uh, general consultant to our investment council. And um, uh, the, the range was between 7.7 .7 and 8.9, and so the board decided that based on that, it was uh, again because we're long term, it was reasonable to uh, uh, to maintain the 8% assumed rate. Our actual experience uh, over the 39 years since uh, uh, starting to invest in in equities, I think, was about has been about 10.73. Uh, percent on average, our annualized return for the last 25 years, including 2008-2009, is about 9.2 percent. Now, you know, we're talking about projecting forward, uh, and uh, you know, I can line up 20 consultants and get you 30 different projections. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, we, like I said, we didn't change it uh, when we had the super high returns in the 80s and the 90s, and. And you know, because of that, we need to see some really solid evidence that things have dramatically changed. If indeed they have, I've I've heard a lot about new normals in 34 years of my career. <laughs> and they always seem to be more related to the old normals, but uh, okay. uh, if you give them enough time. Okay. Uh, we'll take one final question, Dallas. Paul, uh, did plan pay single sum distributions or annuities? Uh, yes, and and we all well we we now we we can do we do lump sum distributions and and to uh, uh, Kathleen's point earlier on uh, when when the members start getting nervous uh, we start seeing the lump sum distributions go up now the actuaries will tell you hey actually that's to your advantage because then you don't have to pay cost of living on them my investment folks will say yeah but. Make sure you keep us aware of the liquidity yeah, needs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but we see about eight percent of our people taking a total lump sum. They'll pull out their entire mm -hmm. account balance, uh, and we see another five or six percent take a, a lump sum plus an annuity, varying out to five years or or, or over their uh, remaining lifespan. But we may be somewhat unique in that Dallas because 
because of the way that we had the account balance driven benefits um, you know in the for the for the third tier we won't try to uh, convert uh, a stream of benefit payments into a present net value and do a lump sum there there's no account balance to to, to take out Carla, the, the employee still is entitled to some death benefit. absolutely and it's the death benefit or the cash value that goes to the account the cash value and so the full death benefit, the 280,000 death the, benefit, still goes yes, to the Yes, absolutely. You know, it's, it's intriguing. I really have to look at it on numbers and figure out how it works. How many out. people have died? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just wondering, how, how many times has it happened where everything went according to the picture? Not like 20, yet. 100? <laughs> Yeah, no, started. No, I haven't done this yet. Okay. This is what we're we're talking about implementing, which, not, by, which which by the way, yeah, which by the way, uh, they our consultants can suggest that we can do this within ninety days once we have right. gone ahead. Yeah, I, I know. Well, once we've gone ahead and, and negotiated with our the, the our earlier ideas. they die, the better. That's called an actuarial gain. <laughs> 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 well, we did that there's this payoff. Thank you. Yes, I mean, some family member's going to say, wait a minute. Grandpa's worth more debt. Than oh, well, on that happy note, um, uh, may I suggest that we take that off the uh, record, um, lest anyone be accusing us of orchestrating, um, and, you know, uh, misfortune to our, our, our pension beneficiaries. On behalf of the uh, New America uh, Foundation and uh, the UC uh, Retirement Security Institute, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, please pay attention to the website. We'll try to get these uh, PowerPoints up as quickly as we can and continue to engage in these issues. It's, it's really uh, important to the, uh, the viability of our systems. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I need to